Hello and welcome to this um, session on mixing. Um, the two things I'm going to cover are how to use EQ and how to use reverb. EQ is a tool that allows us to control the tonal balance of a recording so that we can um, remove any harshness or muddiness or any kind of um, undesirable aspects of the sound. Reverb allows us to simulate the sound of a uh, acoustic space. So most of us are probably recording at the moment in our home and uh, we can use reverb to simulate a nicer acoustic and to place our recordings within that acoustic. When we're working on classical music generally the way that we would mix would be relatively subtle so we're looking to reshape something that already sounds hopefully quite good um, if it doesn't sound good in the first place then mixing classical music becomes really difficult um, things like distortion or um, too much background noise um, if we work on our recording too much and we manipulate it to the point we can't hear any background noise or we remove the distortion that probably means we're going to have cut away a lot of the kind of core sound as well as the uh, undesirable um, parts of that sound as we progress with mixing it becomes more of a kind of an art than a kind of um, technical exercise um, once you kind of really start listening and getting your ears into um, what we're what, what the recording sounds like then we can start to make more kind of positive choices for our recording um, rather than just thinking about negatives we can start to think about okay what could I do to really enhance this or, or make this better but I think it's definitely um, a good thing to start with some basics how to subtly reshape a recording In this recording we're going to look at how to use equalization or uh, colloquially we call this EQ. EQ is a kind of tone control. It allows us to um, reshape the tonal balance of a recording. Um, we use it generally in uh, two ways, uh, either to correct issues in a recording or um, as a way of reshaping or kind of creatively reshaping the sound. You'll often hear people talk about creative and corrective EQ. I don't really see the distinction. Um, correcting something is still a kind of creative choice. But um, when you see those terms, what people will mean when they say cor uh, corrective EQ is um, removing things like muddiness and harshness, um, or overly resonant sounds and I'll show you how to do all of those things. I'm going to start by talking you through an EQ plugin. So I'm working in Pro Tools. Um, I would suggest that you work in any um, software that allows you to use uh, real-time processing. Um, uh, something like Audacity is going to make you process not in real time. So you'll make your EQ choices and then it will process the file and then you'll be able to listen to it. Um, I think it's really important when EQing to be able to press play and to hear what is happening to the sound. With most EQ plugins that you'll find in um, digital audio workstations, um, you will have a graph that shows us how we are manipulating the sound. There are two axes, uh, the y-axis, which shows us the amplitude of the sound. Um, this is measured in decibels. Um, here it's showing us we can add or subtract up, up to 16 dB, and that's an enormous range. Um, and when I come to refine my sounds, I'm going to make much smaller changes than that. But um, as I work with the sound, I'm going to make quite big changes that I can hear so that then I can tell what difference I'm making as I am refining my settings. On the x-axis, we have the frequency content of the sound. 
And this ranges from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is kind of roughly the range of human hearing. Um, 20 hertz would be extremely low. I mean, some organs would go all the way down to 20 hertz. Um, but uh, th that would be for kind of sub effect rather than actual hearing the pitch. Um, and it's divided in roughly into kind of bands. So um, there's a kind of section with lots of information here and that's kind of my low band. And then I've got my mid band here and then my high band up here. Um, and that kind of tells me roughly where um, I'm sitting when I make adjustments. One of the most important controls when we are working with EQ is actually the bypass button and most software will have a bypass button. Uh, it's just kind of a case of finding it and the bypass button allows me to turn the EQ on and off which means I can compare what I've done with what I originally recorded. And that's just a really powerful tool to be able to really measure whether you've actually improved the sound or whether you've negatively affected the sound. The other controls I'm going to tell you about are again common to pretty much any um, EQ plugin, it's just they would be represented differently. Um, in this plugin, um, the bottom control in each of these colour coded sections uh, is the gain control, and this controls how much level I'm adding or subtracting. So I can add 18 dB or subtract 18 dB or anywhere in between. I can also set the center frequency, so the frequency that the EQ is centered around. And I can set that with a high degree of control um, using the dial. The third control is called the Q, and this sets the width of the filter. So the more narrow the filter, the more um, specific the EQ um, will be. Um, so this would very specifically pick out quite a small range around uh, 3 kilohertz. Um, whereas if I broaden the Q setting, it will um, much more generally boost everything uh, above 100 hertz and above, uh, I don't know, I guess about 25k, um, just looking at the graph. Normally, um, a Q setting in, in Pro Tools at least of one um, and some some uh, some plugins you'll see with a Q setting of between kind of 0 0.1 and 10 uh, and some you'll see uh, dB per octave. Um, I would normally use something like uh, a filter width of one or um, somewhere between 6 and 12 dB per octave for a filter and they're kind of generally good ballparks to start with. Um, and from there, I would refine. So let's have a listen to how these different con uh, controls affect the sound. I'm going to start with a recording of my voice, which is part of this uh, suite of um, tutorials and this is a recording of me uh, speaking very closely into an SM58 mic and um, one of the things you'll have learnt about if you've been following these tutorials from the start is the proximity effect and the proximity effect is both a positive and a negative thing and in this recording the low end is a little bit uh, too muddy or uh, resonant So if we listen to this voice, if you are nice and close to it, and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this, I'm quite aware of um, a kind of low uh, resonance in my voice. So to address that, um, I would boost the low frequencies. And I'd to do that in Pro Tools, I'd click on this dot and lots of other EQ plugins would work much the same way. You can click on a dot and move it around. And I would boost quite dramatically the level at that frequency range. And I would just listen for the point where I really hear that low resonance. If you are nice and close to it, and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic, particularly for a vocal. And again, it should sound much fuller. 
So this is a little bit too low. If you are nice and close to it and this is a bit too high. If you are nice and close to it and if you are nice and close right to there, it. Right there, there's just that resonance within the voice. Because this is quite a kind of narrow, pitchy sort of sound, I can actually narrow that filter and be a little bit more specific with the shape of the filter. If you are nice and close to it, and, then, and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic particularly for a vocal. Then I can refine the setting and really find that frequency, and then I can reduce it. If you are nice and close to it, and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic. So let's have a listen to that before. If you are nice and close to it, and this is and after. If you are nice and close to it, and this is kind of almost the minimum dis And the after sounds just a little bit tighter and a little bit less kind of muddy and unclear in the low frequencies. So the way that I approached that was to um, do what I would call boost and sweep. So I click on an EQ. Um, filter and then I move it until I hear something I don't like or I find something I've already identified that I don't like. If you are nice and close to it and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic particularly for a vocal and again it should sound much fuller just around here again I hear a little bit of kind of pitchiness so I'm gonna narrow that filter again. If you are nice and close to it and this is kind of almost and it's just there a kind of almost sort of telephone sound um, and what I'm doing is actually making the recording sound worse in order to make it sound better and again I can just reduce this and again hopefully this is going to sound a little bit more open. If you are nice and close to it and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic. And if we turn the EQ off. If you are nice and close to it and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic. And back on. If you are nice and close to it, and this is kind of almost the minimum distance that I would use this mic, particularly for a vocal. And again, and again, that just sounds a little bit cleaner to me um, with that EQ setting. So that way of working, the kind of boost and sweep method, um, allows us to listen out for certain aspects in recordings that we can then um, address and uh, correct. The second way that we can use uh, corrective EQ is to deal with um, very low frequency rumble. And uh, two of these recordings that we are going to listen to are from um, live concerts in bars that I did for the night with. And because they're in bars, which is a kind of very specific kind of space, they're near a main road, uh, there are lots of fridges at the back of the hall. Uh, there are people um, walking on the roof of the venue um, on the first floor. So there's lots of kind of low rumble in these recordings. So um, this is one of the key things that we address in uh, kind of preparing these recordings for um, uh, distribution. If we have a listen to uh, this recording, just going to go a little bit further back so we can hear some of the rumble in context. If we have a listen just before the recording starts, there's a kind of very gentle background noise, but if I boost that and then highlight it with the EQ plugin, we can really hear the fridge sound there. Um, and that sounds okay. I'm not hugely aware of it if I turn off the plugin when I press play. Um, but if I clean it up, then I'm going to be aware that it's improved. So we're looking at, um, uh, so that's 74 hertz, um, the EQ plugin is telling me. Um, what I'm actually going to do is use a different kind of filter called a high pass filter. And a high pass filter allows me to cut out sound below um, the frequency where it is set. 
Um, if I press play now, it's going to sound quite thin and nasal because I'm cutting out all of the low and mid range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the filter um, to a point where it's not affecting uh, the sound of the uh, viola d'amore, um, but it is cutting out some of this background noise. So that's still too high. I'm starting to hear the mid-range of the instrument there. So around about, um, so that's 80 hertz, around about there, I'm, I'm not hearing that affecting the bottom string of the instrument. Um, I'm also going to use uh, a second filter just to cut out a little bit more at 70 hertz where I'd identified the particular problem. So I'm starting to end up with a slightly stranger EQ and a slightly more um, specific EQ shape that probably looks a little bit unusual on the screen but is hopefully going to address some of this low frequency rumble even better. So if I bypass that there's much more background noise. If I add it back in, then we will hear much less background noise. And that sounds a little bit cleaner. So that would probably be the first thing that I would do with any recording is look at, uh, can I use a high pass filter just to address a little bit of background noise and uh, cut out any um, sub frequencies that are below the, um, the, the frequency level of the instrument recorded. So I'm going to talk you through the decisions that I made for one of these particular recordings. And this is a recording of a uh, viola and accordion duo. And this is mixed very slightly differently in, um, in the final version. But as an example, I've brought it in here. So um, there are some balance issues in this recording that I would probably address between the accordion and the viola, but because I've mixed it down to stereo, it's very tricky to, to readdress those issues. Because this is mic'd quite closely, we end up with a little bit of boominess in the low end. If we have a listen to this passage, the uh, bass side of the accordion, um, without uh, the EQ, um, really kind of covers over the sound of the viola and it's really kind of sucking up a lot of space within this mix. And the sound uh, of the accordion is really attractive, it's really full, it's really rich, but it is um, really slightly covering over that uh, viola sound. If I boost this kind of low end down here, um, what you'll hear is that it's really resonant in this register and a little bit unclear and a little bit muddy. There's not kind. Uh, there's not a kind of definition in that register, so I can pull that down a little bit, maybe narrow that filter a little bit, and that's going to just uh, tidy that up a little bit. So I am sucking level out of the low end, uh, which is in a way a bit of a shame. But if it's for the betterment of the recording, then that's all fine. So if you have listened to this now. It should sound a little bit more compact in the bass register. And so that bassy end isn't quite taking over the recording in the way that it was. Um, 
right at the bottom though there's quite a bit of useful very kind of sub bass so if we have a listen to this boosted quite a lot particularly on those last two chords. And that gives it the accordion a little bit more kind of a, a, a three dimension, almost three dimensional sound. If we have a listen to that passage again, maybe not with it boosted quite so much, but with a kind of subtle lift in the bass end. It gives that kind of rich, almost organ-like sound that the accordion can capture, um, but in a register that is never going to cover over the viola. Um, so that's kind of starting to go a little bit beyond uh, correcting muddiness or harshness. That's allowing me to um, start to reshape the sound of the recording uh, to improve it in a kind of more creative or positive way. I could look at adding a little bit of brightness to try and bring out the viola in this passage. And so adding a little bit of brightness has maybe boosted the viola but it's also boosting the upper harmonics of the accordion sound which are also really rich so that this is where in order to fix this i'd probably need to go back to the original recording and address the balance of the microphones um rather than looking to eq uh, a final mix and this this is maybe where eq um reaches a kind of limit of what it's capable of doing. Um, so with a stereo file, we can look to address uh, certain things, but you would never really be able to fix balance issues. Um, and that's kind of the same with uh, a stereo mic placement. If the balance isn't good um, from the ensemble in the room, then it's going to be very difficult to fix that. As a final example, I'd like to take you back to um, one of the recordings of my voice and it's with um, the R88 ribbon mic. And um, this is when I'm very, very close to the mic. And again, I just want to talk you through the decisions, decisions I made. Um, this is a really short little excerpt because um, there was only a short period where I was very close to the mic. And so I'm going to loop this. and. Um, the first thing I noticed was um, some low end rumble. Again, the low end comes up a little bit. Again, the low, or kind of low end extra resonance. So I used a high pass filter just to limit that a little bit. The next thing I noticed was, as with the SM58, a little bit of resonance in the base of my voice. Again, the low end comes up a little bit where that's really muffly and um, if I set that back to its kind of default position again the low end comes up a little bit you know it's we're, we're talking about subtlety here but if we can improve it we should and just reducing that opens up the sound a little bit again the low end comes up a little bit the next thing that I became really aware of was um, some harshness in the upper frequencies and if I boost this it's around about three kilohertz Again, the low end comes up a little bit. And again, it's a little bit like a kind of telephony sort of, um, we'd call it a band passed voice um, in that register. It's just a little bit harsh and um, unpleasant. Again, the low end comes up a little bit. So if I reduce that um, and also reduce the low end, then my voice sounds a lot more natural with the EQ applied. Again, the low end comes up a little bit. So that's with the EQ, and this is without. Again, the low end comes up a little bit. And the original sounds all right, but processed, it just sounds a little bit more natural. Again, the low end comes up a little bit. 
and a little bit more open and a little bit more clear I'm more aware of uh, what I'm saying um, or I can listen to the words without having to concentrate quite so much on the sound and so there are kind of three bands that I think or three things that we would generally deal with when using EQ. The first thing is uh, bassy muddiness. And we covered that with high pass filters or um, as, as we did here, just cutting out a little bit of low end. Um, the next aspect we might find is kind of resonance that would normally happen in the mid register. Again, the low end comes up a little bit and I'm kind of exaggerating it there. We can hear that that's quite- Again, the low end comes up a little bit. It Again, the low end comes up a little bit. That's starting to sound quite resonant and um, as though there's kind of too much frequency content in that register and we could uh, again reduce that with EQ. Um, and the third kind of thing we might find is harshness and that would be a kind of around about three kilohertz. Normally um, around about three kilohertz can sound quite harsh if it's not carefully captured. Again, the low end comes up a little bit and that sounds like that, that just, it's almost a little bit like being prodded in the forehead or it can feel a little bit like that when you're listening. In this video, we're gonna look at the use of reverb when we're mixing classical music. As we are all classical musicians, we all know that different acoustic spaces have different reverberant characteristics. And these really help to shape the way that we perform and the music we perform uh, sounds in that space. Uh, ideally, of course, you would be performing in situ in a nice acoustic and the phrasing and the tempos and uh, the way that we shape the music would all be kind of subtly influenced by that reverberant sound. But if we're all recording in our living rooms or in um, kind of strange spaces at home, then, or, or not ideal spaces at home at least, then uh, adding artificial reverb can really help to um, give a little bit more space and a little bit more kind of a, a, a nice aura um, to our recordings. When I'm thinking about reverb, uh, particularly on a kind of basic level, um, I think about three things or three characteristics of spaces. Um, I think about the length of the reverb and that's usually determined, uh, tells us kind of how big or smaller spaces, big spaces have long reverbs. I think about the frequency response of the reverb. So reverbs don't tail away in a kind of linear way. Um, usually the high frequencies tail away faster than the low frequencies. And um, so different uh, rooms will have slightly different characteristics in terms of whether they sound quite bright or quite uh, almost natural and as though they're not really shaping the sound, um, they're just lengthening it or they might sound quite dark. The third thing that I think about, and this isn't really characteristic of the room, this is more kind of characteristic of where we might place microphones or the perspective from where we might listen from, um, and that is the amount of the reverb that we hear relative to the dry signal. So this is the ratio between the dry and the reflected sound. And this will determine kind of how deep, how much detail we hear in the recording and how much of the ambient sound we hear in the recording. Um, some plugins let you control lots of other aspects of the sound. Um, the one that I'm going to use today is uh, a really nice reverb plugin, um, but it's also the one that I have that is most visually straightforward. Um, so hopefully you can kind of follow the choices that I'm making. In this section, we're going to look at the different controls in a couple of different reverb plugins. Um, there are three open on the screen. Uh, in the top left, I have uh, the Space plugin, which is a Pro Tools specific plugin. Um, bottom left, we have Dverb, which is the kind of 
stock reverb that comes with Pro Tools. And in the top right, we have um, the Lexicon reverb, which is a third party one, um, which is uh, the reverb that I generally use for most of my work. There are two kind of types of reverb here. Um, the reverb in the top left is what we call an impulse response. And this reverb is going to imitate the sound of a specific space. And in the right hand side of this reverb, I can select a specific space. So I could open up chambers and then choose a Hyde Street chamber, or I could find a large chapel and uh, choose one of these. Um, in this plugin, they've also got the Concertgebouw um, in Amsterdam. Um, so they've got some kind of nice spaces that they're imitating. Um, the other two plugins are algorithmic uh, reverbs. And so they're using kind of mathematical procedures just to imitate the sound of a acoustic. It's not a specific acoustic and we can um, kind of tailor the sound of um, these to our taste. Um, that's not to say with the impulse response, you can't adjust the sound of the reverb, but the way that the reverb is created is fundamentally different. And I want to talk you through all of the different controls that I think are really important in these plugins. You'll notice that in the three examples, uh, they have varying degrees of um, controls. Um, the impulse response reverb has seven faders. The um, D verb in the bottom left has uh, five dials and uh, this fade control and the one in the top right has nine faders to control the different aspects of the reverb. There are really only two or three of these that I really work with on a regular basis when I'm mixing classical music. If we look at um, the Lexicon reverb in the top right hand corner, I work with the preset, so I would click into a category, so maybe choose a large hall, and then I would choose a specific sound from that. And that's going to control the kind of color of our reverb. And we'll talk about how to choose the color of this later. So I choose the kind of style of sound that I'm going to use in that way. In uh, Dverb, you can move between halls, churches, plates, rooms, and you can make it small, medium, or large. In uh, uh, space plugin, uh, we can choose the style of reverb by selecting our different um, spaces. So can check about at the front, can check about at the back, um, a parish hall, and uh, can choose different kinds of uh, sounds within all of these kind of presets. The second setting that I work with is the reverb time. And in the Lexicon plugin, we've got a fader here that says reverb time, and I can set it anywhere between 181 seconds, so it doesn't quite go to infinite, or down to 0.3 seconds for this particular reverb. In Dverb, I can set it all the way down to 200 milliseconds, and it goes even shorter if I choose a small space, all the way up to an infinite reverb, so it would never stop decaying. And this allows me to set how long the reverb is, and this is going to roughly tell our ears kind of how big the space is. The final setting that I work with is the mix control, and this determines how much reverb we hear relative to the dry signal. So if I set the mix to 100% in the Lexicon Reverb, all we're going to hear is reverberant sound. And if I set it to 0%, all we're going to hear is dry sound. And we have a dry wet mix setting in the Dverb plugin in the bottom left, which I can change again between 0 and 100%. In the Impulse Response Reverb, this has a slightly different way of working with the wet dry control. So we have faders to control the wet dry level. And this isn't unusual, but it is more common, I think, to see a mix setting rather than to see two faders to control the, um, the balance. When I'm working with this plugin, 
I generally will turn the dry signal up to 0 dB and then I'll pull the wet signal all the way out and then I'll just ease it up until I like the amount of wet signal that I've added. Um, and that's the way that I find it most easy to control this plugin. So I set my dry level, at it's kind of default level 0 dB and then boost the wet signal until I like the setting. Um, if we start with it just um, with wet at 0 dB, all we're going to hear is reverberant sound. So if I listen just to the impulse response reverb and I'm going to set it to um, this parish hall. We can hear that that's only the reverberant sound. If I boost the dry setting um, and then pull out the wet fader, then we'll hear only the dry signal. And then I would pull up the wet fader until I like the level. And that's not bad as a starting point. With the algorithmic reverbs, I would choose a, a wet dry setting of somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. So set at 100 percent, all we're going to hear is reverberant sound. And at zero percent, all we're going to hear is dry sound. So those are the kind of three aspects of the reverb that I'm going to control on a regular basis. The style of the reverb, which is basically what kind of space we're in. Um, the uh, length of the reverb, so either reverb time or decay time. And the level of reverb added into the mix, so where we set our mix setting. In the next video, we'll look at ways of applying um, these tools. So rather than just knowing about what they do, um, I'll show you some strategies for how to make choices about your reverb type, um, length and the amount that we're adding into the mix. I'm going to go back to um, the recording of the viola and accordion that we heard in the EQ example. And one of the things we noted when we were talking about the EQ of this recording was that there's quite a lot of low end and I've not cut all of it out. So it's still kind of a big proportion of low frequency content. So when I'm thinking about the uh, character of the reverb, um, what I would at least try in the first place is a reverb that doesn't have a lot of low frequency content. So as with orchestrating a piece of music, if there's a lot of space in the upper register but the bass end is quite congested, it wouldn't be good, a good idea to put a, a pianissimo, um, I don't know, bottom C of a bassoon in, in that part. If there were already trombones and double basses and tubers going at double forte, we're not going to hear that bassoon. But if you pitch the bassoon or an oboe in a much higher register, then that might actually cut through um, or just sit on top of that uh, low end um, kind of, uh, I'm, I, mess isn't the right word, but content. So often if a recording has one particular characteristic, it's good to actually make use of the opposite characteristic. So this is quite, has quite a lot of low frequency. So I'm going to try a reverb that tells me that it is light. Um, so I'm going to add a large hall um, and one that is called a large light hall. Um, I'm going to set, set the reverb time at a couple of seconds. I don't think this recording can take much more than a couple of seconds. And what we're going to hear is only the reverberant sound. So we're going to hear no dry sound. So we'll get a sense of how this reverb is manipulating the uh, kind of frequency content of the recording. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm really aware there of the um, the the kind of soaring viola melody and the um, kind of sparkly harmonics of the accordion. Let's have a listen to a reverb that is telling us that it is dark and see what we hear there. Again, I'm going to set it to a couple of seconds. And that, to me, kind of really contributes to muddying up that bottom register that we've just spent a little bit of time cleaning up. So it wouldn't make sense to me to start putting in lots of kind of low-end reverb. I'm going to try um, the the kind of default, what, what another plugin might call a natural um, hall sound. So some plugins you would find, they would call it a dark, natural and light or bright sound. The, uh, in this plugin, I have either light, dark or, or kind of in the middle. And I'd really expected to like the light reverb over this one. But actually, I think I possibly prefer this reverb. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try um, setting this reverb with a lower mix setting. So this is going to start to add back in uh, the dry sound. And I'm going to have a listen to it with this reverb and see how that kind of helps to uh, soften the kind of um, closeness of this recording. So we can hear when I press stop that reverb trail and how much kind of reverb we're adding in. And and to me that sounded pretty good. I, I would accept that. I would think possibly there's too much reverb. Um, I'm going to try the light reverb this time. Again, set it to a couple of seconds. I like how clean that sounds. Um, just at the end with those kind of organy low um, uh, accordion notes, I was really aware that they didn't sound particularly reverberant. Let's have a listen to the uh, dark reverb and see how that works and see if that does sound too muddy. Now we've got a kind of better balance between the dry and the reflected sound. <laughs> So for my taste, I I definitely felt I wanted less reverb there, but I think it's actually that I wanted less reverb in the low register. So it's not actually that I wanted less reverb overall because I wasn't really bothered by the mix setting with the two previous reverbs. So when it was adding in the kind of upper register or the mid register, I was quite happy with that. And that's because I think there's too much low end within that reverb. So if we go back to the um, the kind of one in the middle, and we have a, one last listen to this passage with that mix setting at um, kind of 30%. So this is mostly dry sound and a little bit of wet sound. Um, I feel like the balance between dry and reverberant sound is you know, just about right, if not wanting a teeny bit less um, reverberant sound. And also I feel like this is going to give me a little bit more reverb on that very bottom note of the accordion. Um, so it's not going to feel like that that note is kind of too close and in a different space to the to the rest of the instrument. <laughs> 
So with the light reverb, I was kind of really aware that it was almost two different instruments, the the kind of high accordion and the low accordion, and this feels like it's kind of gluing the, the whole accordion part together a little bit better than um, the lighter reverb. So that, this, th these are the things I would think about when choosing the character of the reverb. When choosing the um, mix setting, I'm going to move on to a recording by a piano trio. And um, I have uh, kind of settings that are, are real go-tos. So somewhere usually in between um, 10% and 30% uh, if, if you've got a mix setting uh, would be the amount of reverb I would add in. If we go anywhere above, so if I set this to 40, it's gonna sound a little bit like it's been recorded in a bathroom. So if we have a listen to that without the reverb, you can hear that that's actually quite a dry and quite a detailed recording. If I set the mix setting at 10%, let's have a listen to what this sounds like. And here it feels a little bit like the instruments are detached from one another. So if I boost the mix setting a little bit, then we can have a listen to this and see if this, that's addressed this issue. And to me, that feels a little bit like it's kind of uh, gluing the ensemble together a little bit better. Um, one way that I check my mix setting is by listening to the uh, decay um, at the end of a phrase. And listening to how that reverb dies away. And that seems like quite a nice balance of reverberant sound that's being added in. The, the other way that I check that is, again, using the bypass uh, function. So this is without reverb. And with reverb. And it's not sounding too reverberant um, and it's not sounding kind of too dry and exposed. So for me, that's a, a pretty good mix setting. If I push it further, it might start to sound a little bit too wet. And for me, that's starting to take a little bit of detail away from the um, decorative uh, runs in the piano. The other way we might address that is by looking at the reverb time and um, depending on the project, um, if this was an album of music that was all supposed to be recorded in the same place, then I would look at setting a overall reverb time for the whole project. Um, but if this was for a single recording of just this movement, then I would look at setting a very specific reverb time that works really well for this movement. And because there's quite a lot of fast um, decorative detail, I would think about using a slightly shorter reverb. Um, and uh, with pop music, when when you're mixing, you can look at uh, the kind of cadence of the, of the parts, so like the cadence of the voice, um, where it sort of dies away and you can try and get your reverb to die away kind of in time with the music or if it's drums you would have a really short reverb that kind of dies away just in time for each kind of the main hits in the part and we can kind of apply that thinking here so if we listen with quite a lot of reverb and when I listen to that decay it's, it's a little bit long for the kind of um, I suppose uh, the pulse of the music. That's much closer to the kind of tempo, the length of that decay. Mm -hmm. 
that seems almost kind of in time. It was maybe just a touch short. Now I can reduce the mix setting, but I can possibly add in a little bit more reverb to make it a little bit more distant without it becoming too wet because this uh, the reverb length is working um, much more effectively in time with the music um, and uh, it, because it's shorter, we'll hear less reverb. <laughs> So for me, um, what I thought there was actually, I quite liked that there was a little bit more uh, wet sound in the mix, but um, that it was slightly shorter, which kind of kept the clarity of um, particularly the piano parts there um, with their kind of fast runs. So just um, to sum up, um, I guess different different music or different styles of music and musical material will reward different kinds of um, reverbs. Uh, if you're just doing a kind of single track, then you can be really specific with um, the choice that you make. Um, but remember that we're basically thinking about three things. And if you remind yourself to kind of listen out for these things, it makes the process much easier and it takes the kind of, um, I don't know what to do kind of feeling out of the the problem of working with reverb. Um, so we're thinking about the the length of the reverb. So how big or small do we want the space to sound? And does the length of the reverb work with the kind of speed and tempo of the music? Um, we're thinking about the frequency response of the reverb. So what's the character of it? If we've got lots of lots of low end material, then maybe we want a slightly brighter reverb because there's going to be space in the upper register or the upper frequencies where we can, um, which we can occupy with reverb. Um, whereas if it occupies too much of the same register, then it is going to kind of muddy or or mess up the uh, the kind of mix. The same would be true if you had a mix that had a lot of high frequency content, you wouldn't want to use too light a reverb. And the third thing is the amount of reverb. And this is kind of how uh, we balance the direct and the reflected sound. Um, this setting um, is kind of also sensitive to those other two things. If you get your um, reverb time and the kind of color of the reverb right, then you'll find you can add a little bit more reverb without it getting in the way because it's working very specifically. Um, if you are using um, less than ideal reverb settings, then you'll find it gets in the way much more quickly and makes the recording too muddy or too bathroomy. Some ballpark settings um, that I would suggest. So for classical music, I would normally use a reverb length of between one and three seconds for anything that you want it to feel like it's in a concert hall. If you want it to feel like it's in a much bigger space, then you're talking three to five seconds for a kind of cathedrally or church sort of reverb. Um, different kinds of music can take that longer setting, uh, choral music or, or uh, some early music can, can take that quite well. Uh, mix setting, uh, somewhere between 10 and 30%, um, depending on the material and how wet you want the recording to sound. 